Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a talk uh, for the perception action learning uh, from metric semantics in understanding to high level task execution uh, workshop for ICRA 2020. The title of the talk uh, is uh, posted as a question, and my question is Are deep learning semantics ready for high level decision making? My name is uh, Cesar Cadena. And just to set up uh, the, the talk in terms of what uh, we are expecting in the workshop, uh, I will uh, talk here about uh, learning and perception, uh, learning for perception, and actually focus on the semantics in understanding. And in my view, what is needed or uh, is some uh, basic requirement for the really having a high level tax ex execution. And the key word that I want to um, uh, highlight here, or that you remember, is the world of uncertainty. Uh, and this talk is around that uh, keyword. First thing that I want to, to do is to thank uh, uh, my students uh, who have uh, developed uh, most of the techniques that we are going to present uh, out of our lab. Um, uh, mainly, Herman has been uh, leading uh, this research in his PhD uh, with the help of uh, several master students. Uh, uh, in, in his research. Let's start by, by the semantics in understanding uh, part of, of the talk. Uh, we, I think we, at this point, nobody uh, can doubt that uh, deep learning has, bring, has brought uh, so many advances for the understanding of, of images, right? Uh, the state of the art semantics and mentors are uh, amazingly accurate, uh, something that we would think of uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's not only semantic segmentation, we also have uh, instance segmentation, for example, or even object detection in very, very uh, difficult uh, situations. Even more, we can have instance and semantics and all in, in one uh, to have enough segmentation of the, of the scene. Uh, it's really amazing what we can do. Um, we see how uh, the community push more and more to have even multitask uh, one one image and you can then from that extract everything, uh, even the depth from a monocular image, right? An example of this multitasking uh, is the, the analysis and the work done by, by Samir in CBPR 2018, where um, they have uh, under the framework task economy, um, they have uh, developed this uh, framework where you have so many tasks and you will find actually what is the interrelation between tasks, which tasks help each other in, a, in an understanding of uh, indoor scenes, outdoor, and so on. It's, it's really great. But then let's think a little bit. This is in the side, of, for example, the computer vision. What, what about the, the other side of the table? Uh, applications in robotics. How are we in robotics? exploiting uh, the semantics uh, or these advances in deep learning and in computer vision. Um, the first uh, uh, that we could say is that by being aware of objects or in our environments, we have seen works improving estimation, the maps, uh, the trajectories, uh, and so on. On the left side, you could see how uh, by detecting objects and segmenting those objects, then you create these graphs of uh, similar to the post graph, but now you include objects as a nose on this graph that allows you to optimize their locations over time. On the right side, uh, we can see how this instance uh, segmentation can be combined uh, with geometry segmentation. So, so for, in order to have or a, a better understanding of a full 3D reconstruction when we now can have the, the, the understanding of what is an object that maybe I have prior knowledge and objects that maybe are just, I'm just discovering them on the fly. This also can be translated to the autonomous driving. And we have seen how uh, this knowledge about the classes, the objects, allow us to improve in our data association for, uh, for tracking, for loop closing, and, and in that way, improving uh, the estimation of the trajectory of the ego vehicle, right? 
Uh, but not just objects help us and the full set of semantics of having the whole set of classes uh, in an image also help us as a, having an abstraction layer to, to solve very difficult problems in, in for example, loop closing in place recognition and localization, where uh, even in the very difficult cases of uh, top-down views versus uh, front-facing cameras, are able to localize to each other because the semantics allows you for these invariances in the point of view. On the right side, we have seen how this, um, it's this abstraction allow, uh, uh, allows uh, different works to, to remove these uh, objects or these instances that you know that they would be dynamic, that they are moving and such that your reconstructions, they are not uh, affected or they are not corrupted and they don't have this cost on, on, on the point cloud or in the representation that you choose. Um, but it's not just for reconstruction and trajectory estimation. Semantics also allows you and has been proven that allows you for um, a, a better or a easier uh, transfer from simulation or to real world. They reduce their reality gap. This abstraction level, what allows you is to say, look, I have images that maybe I have from simulation. I have my semantic segmentation, but I can learn to drive in a simulation on that, uh, on top of that abstraction, such that when I go to the real world, and if I have a, a good semantic segmentation, then I can deploy my learned model for, for uh, for navigating around, for driving around, and deploy it in, in the uh, in the real world, right? Reduces this reality gap. <clears throat> um, but one thing that we have to be clear is that um, uh, robots operate in an open world, right? And what do I mean by that? When we operate in an open world, is of course. Right, we, we have semantic segmentation techniques that they are very nice. We see on, on the left side, we see how these uh, methods are, are just uh, uh, having a like, almost perfect segmentations, right? And then we go for, for a different city, a different country. The, 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 the traffic is a little bit more challenging. There are more structures. And still these, these segmentations, they, they, they are working fine. Right? Well, I mean, it's, it's sensible outcomes that we obtain here and that maybe a, a high level task can, uh, can be performed. But um, that, those are not the only cases that we are going to find in the real world. We are going to find changes because of weather, changes because of uh, natural disasters. Uh, and we don't know actually what we are going to face at some point, right? And then we can see how they affect really our techniques. Doesn't matter how much you train in, in normal techniques, you always will find something special, right? And okay, you could say, you know, uh, we can train for this, it's a periodic event, we have seen this before, maybe, maybe we are able to handle uh, snow, right? for example, right? But there are always other uh, situations that, um, they actually, they, even the, the naked eye is very difficult uh, for a human to distinguish what is in front of you, right? And uh, relying only on this uh, outcome of the classification per pixel, it uh, seems that is not the right thing to do, right? And you could say, look, maybe it's true, but this, these images are very, you know, you look a lot in Google to find those images. No, no, not really. And actually, you could see um, uh, the talk, a very nice talk from Andre Carpati in, in the workshop, CBBVR workshop uh, on scalability in autonomous driving, where he um, uh, showed us these examples in a, in, in a company, right? In, in the Tesla uh, autonomous uh, driving uh, project, where he, he called needles in a haystack. They are hunting, he's hunting these needles because they occur and those needles are the ones that are going to be problematic for safety uh, reasons, where all of these images that he's presenting here are real. 
Um, this, uh, unfortunately, we cannot take this uh, like a just a research question. This is a matter of, of safety. And then we have to really, really pay attention to safety for deployment in the real world. <coughs> Excuse us. Then um, let's uh, analyze a little bit uh, what, what is the outcome of a semantic cementer uh, nowadays. This is an image uh, that has been segmented. Uh, it's an image from the lost and found data set. It's a uh, data set that contains some objects that have been uh, located that are outside of the training. Cityscapes, for example, of outside of the normal objects that you would find in the in the, the urban driving data sets. Then um, if we see this image, then there are different things that we can find. For example, yes, we have misclassifications. Then some different textures in the road maybe confuse you. Right? But sometimes those misclassifications, depends on the classes that are being misclassified, are more difficult or less uh, problematic. More importantly, <coughs> is uh, to talk about the objects that they were not present in the training set and they are still being one or misclassified or they are just completely ignored and then just, just think that they are they don't even exist. They, 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 you estimate a growth in this case for this box, right? Um, out of this, you can see that uh, deep learning is really unreliable outside of the training distribution. And that is the statement uh, uh, um, that I, I will argue that is true right now. Uh, there are, of course, several methods that have been proposed over the years uh, to, to come up on how to deal with that uh, confidence or uncertainty of these outcomes of the networks. One possibility, or classical one, is to take the softmax uh, confidence uh, and compute over of the softmax and entropy to, to approximate if we should be confident or not on the outcome. <coughs> softmax is very easy to confuse with the probability because yes, the outcome sum from zero to one and all the scores they sum up to one, then why not? Right, but they are not a probability distribution. Right. <coughs> then, um, if we continue with that, then uh, here just to 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 clarify the the white part is uh, the high confidence or uh, low uncertainty. The darker uh, means uh, low confidence or a high uncertainty, and we can see here, for example, in this example of the, the the softmax is overconfident on, on regions that he, the, the system is just uh, missing uh, objects in front of, of the car. Uh, a better approach uh, has been proposed uh, and it was uh, uh, exploiting dropout, this regularizer that we have for our networks as a Bayesian approximation, right? Uh, an approximation to the base neural networks, right? And uh, it was, uh, it's kind of a, a good idea, right? Because then if we have these ensembles of networks, then by the voting of all of these networks, then we will understand what could be uncertain and which, what, could, uh, what should be, uh, what we could trust. The outcome of this uh, uh, dropout, uh, or this inference with the dropout, uh, we call it, uh, or it's called the epistemic uncertainty, because they are uh, encoding the uncertainty that, or the noise that can be uh, modeled by the model or the data uh, that, uh, that you use for training. Right. On the other hand, you have the aleatory uncertainty that it, the aleatory uncertainty. The difference would be that this is a noise that comes with the sensor, that comes with the data, and you cannot reduce that uncertainty even if you have much more data available. The epistemic uncertainty, on the other hand, could reduce 
its uncertainty if it has access to more data, right? Then uh, as an example here, we, we run in uh, the, the approximation with dropout. We are still missing um, uh, or being overconfident in the regions that we shouldn't, right? We are missing the object on, on the back here. A different approach was proposed uh, by Papernode uh, in the image uh, classification setup where what the uh, was trying to do was to say, okay, how do I detect that my image has been uh, attacked, right? In this case, by, by this uh, noise pattern here. And then the idea is pretty simple, has been used before in machine learning in different techniques, but uh, it's simple, but very powerful. And it's saying, you no, know, you can compute embeddings of the feature space and compute what are the distances, which are the neighbors of those in this space after each layer that you are operating. If everything is right, your neighbors should uh, be in the same class. The majority of your neighbors should uh, be in agreement, right? If not, uh, it, it's probably, is the most likely is that your embeddings are jumping to different classes every time that you go through the layers, uh, right? And that uh, works pretty nice uh, for the image cl classification. But it's a little bit more difficult in the semantic segmentation setup, given that now we don't need the classification for the whole image, we need a classification for every pixel. Then it's, it becomes unfeasible to keep track of all possible neighbors or to even compute the neighbors, keeping all the training data sets in, the, in, in, a, uh, in memory uh, or to compute k nearest neighbors of with the all training uh, data set with all, for every pixel, you need a representation for the embedding in every layer. Um, you could approximate that with a subset of the training, maybe with a validation set or a subset training set, but then would be would reduce the power of this technique anyway. Unfortunately, um, uh, Underbone and also uh, Bloom, they have proposed uh, how to do this for the semantic segmentation. And the way to do it is to, instead of having all the neighbors, is to approximate the neighborhood by computing the density of the neighborhood. And the, if we compute the density in the embed, embedding space, it's uh, uh, faster and now it's feasible to compute how far are we or how dense is the neighborhood uh, around my embedding uh, representation for a given pixel. And you can propagate that over uh, the following layers, right? Once you have all the accumulation of these uh, densities, then you can compute uh, if. Uh, your approach was something reasonable, was close to something that was in your training uh, data or not. And as we see here, the performance is a little bit better. We kind of detect these objects, but we can also see how it's a little bit more noisy in the rest of the images where we shouldn't uh, uh, have these problems. Um, all the techniques that we have discussed so far, they are um, kind of, you don't need training data in, out of distribution. And that makes sense because usually we don't have, if they are called out of distribution, it's because we don't have access to them. But there are other series of techniques where uh, we can have a proxy for the out of distribution. Okay. And one of them that I will mention very briefly here is uh, having a direct, let priors, how, having priors on these uh, out of distribution uh, samples. And the idea would be in this case, if we use a direct uh, distribution for this prior, is that in this, if we take the cityscape data set, we have a set that is called void and is representing all the things that they were not. Um, they couldn't be uh, classified in the ground truth like one of the main classes, right? Then all of these void uh, instances 
are going to be uh, the training, the proxy for the auto distribution. And what we want is that the concentration parameters uh, for the distribution and uh, for these uh, sections are flat, right? We, we want that they are flat, that we don't vote for any of the classes, main classes. And what we want for a class that we know that belongs to the ground truth, then we want a very sharp decision uh, that uh, we are very sure of about this. And then you require to retrain your network uh, with these priors such that, um, uh, that you can approximate this flat distribution for the void or for the classes that don't belong to the main ones. <coughs> the outcome of something like this is actually looks not bad, right? We have even more, all everything that was not in the main class is, is uh, highlighted, right? And at least the two boxes, uh, they, they, they are detected, but you could detect some false positives behind there as part of the noise that is incorporated because of the void class. Um, then if we evaluate this, all of these techniques in, in, a, in a data sets, uh, very popular data sets in machine learning, we find that they work amazingly well. For example, in the popular MNIST uh, data set, versus uh, Omniglot, if MNIST is the, the training the data and Omniglot is the out of distribution, it's practically a solved problem. Similar happens to, similar thing happens to uh, uh, images of uh, street houses and versus uh, images of small objects, uh, of objects, uh, small images of objects. We almost, we are in 90%, 87%, even with the submax that was not working that well before. Right? Then if that is the case, uh, what is happening here, right? And what is happening is that these kind of toy data sets to proof concepts are very uh, uh, far in the difficulties from what is the real world. Uh, for that reason, we have uh, launched the Fish Sketch Benchmark data set. And this benchmark, what is it doing is it evaluating the techniques uh, to know if you are overconfident, if you can express the, uh, the right uncertainties in real data with uh, taking the lost and found uh, data set, but also uh, to check the, generaliz uh, the generalization capabilities of your approach uh, with unknown objects, with objects that uh, are very hard that you will ever have in, in your training data set, right? Something that is updated. Um, uh, regularly. To guide you in the results that you could find in the benchmark, uh, for example, here, I uh, will show what are the results for the Dirby uh, 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 priors. Then the first thing that you will see is what are the requirements of the method. For example, if you the method required for training uh, will be marked here, if the method needs a proxy for the distribution data, will mark here, otherwise you will not have it, right? We also want to know how that uh, performs in the original tax, in the semantic segmentation, in this case, in the cityscape data set. It's important to solve this uh, problem of the confidence while keeping up the best possible uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, then uh, we will see what is the average precision in anomaly detection, Right, higher is the, the best. And uh, in the safety side, we want to know what is the rate of false positives at true positive rate of 95%, right? Then this value, the lowest is the best. This is for the real world data, when we will have the same for uh, a dynamic data sets that uh, been, they, they are updated uh, time to time. And what is the purpose of these data set is that uh, there is no chances to overfit the benchmark. There is always something of the news out of distribution, really out of distribution, that, uh, that will test uh, over time uh, if the, the, the approach uh, uh, is still valid, right? If we do this with some of the techniques that we have uh, seen today, uh, we can see that 
there is kind of a trade-off between what was the semantic segmentation target, the mean intersection over union of the, of the task on cityscapes, versus uh, what is the result, for example, in the average uh, precision. Yeah. And the highest average precision sacrifices uh, some amount in the semantic segmentation. Right. <clears throat> uh, we also see that between the synthetic augmented uh, data, uh, dynamically augmented data, there is a tray as a chief is that looks not easy but easier at least than what is the real world data. Um, and it's interesting to see how average precision, for example, doesn't really mean that uh, the safety is guarantee, right? Or that safety guarantee doesn't really mean that you are detecting the, the, uh, the hard cases or the good anomaly cases. So conclusion if we, of this slide, what we see is that if we take the Pascal challenge or ImageNet detection challenge, uh, we are quite far from an, in anomaly detection. We are quite far of the numbers in, in average precision at least. Uh, there is not good method yet, uh, at least evaluated in the benchmark. Some quality, qualitative examples of uh, these uh, uh, results can be seen here, where uh, this is the uh, dog that is inserted in the image. And uh, we see more or less all of them have some clue where is the dog. Uh, the direct prior doesn't work that well there. Submark so doesn't work that well there. But it's, it's not that that bad. If we go to the Lausanne found, then we saw this image all, uh, all over the talk. Um, we see how learning avoid class and other different methods is completely failing. Uh, uh, before was very good, now it's completely failing, and uh, others start to miss uh, the important objects. Same happened with another image uh, that we have here, and then all the methods start to fail. Uh, then we cannot really uh, trust yet one of the methods. I want to say that the fishy escapes uh, benchmark is open for submission and is also part of the uh, Bayesian deep learning benchmark uh, uh, set where there are combinations of urban driving, fish escapes, medical diagnosis, and other um, tasks uh, where. Uh, the goal is to, to evaluate how good are we in the introspection of these methods. <clears throat> then uh, if we go to, to back to this uh, question on how well this uncertainty estimation works for this uh, deep learning method, it's, it's very hard. They are not working very well. But the good news is that we can measure them. And uh, results so far are very clear, and uh, we need more work to do here. There are different challenges. We have to to maybe think uh, if we have to match the methods to the specific problem for safety or for precision. Um, at least for the safety side, there is still too much noise. Uh, there are too many false positives uh, for a good uh, threshold for safety. Um, and we could see how the unsupervised methods, the ones that doesn't require any change in your networks or in the system, are still uh, lacking behind uh, in the results. I would like to almost uh, finish uh, saying uh, to state the, the unopened problem. And uh, my, my statement would say, I argue that a deep learning solution in perception is unreliable outside of the training distribution um, in general. but. One thing that I would say is that in robotics, um, it, we require in robotics a solution for safe deployment. We need to work on this because we require it. And, uh, but second thing that I would say is that also robotics give a great opportunity to work on it, to find a solution. Provides, in, depending on the task, we can find interaction with the environment. We can have continuous learning through experiences of the robot. Uh, on the wall, and we can have this closed loop perception, decision, action, come back to the perception such that we can exploit all of these to find uh, 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 a better solution uh, for the 
for the perception side. I'm happy uh, to see that there is some progress being done in, in, in the area by, by us, by other groups where detecting the anomalies is, is a, a key uh, ingredient for a safe navigation or uh, in uh, different applications, uh, detecting what is out of your distribution is very important because maybe you want your, your, your environment clean or in a construction site, you don't want any object in the middle uh, that can um, damage uh, the navigation of, or the measurements that you need to do. Right. With this, I want to, to say uh, thank you uh, to the organizers and just uh, thank you to all uh, my collaborators. Thank you.